like that song and I think the Lord does too. Sing it again. One, two, three, four. You are love, you are life, you are Lord over everything. Alpha, Omega, Jehovah, the King of kings, wonderful way maker, worthy of my offering, hallowed be thy name. You are love, you are life, you are Lord over everything. Alpha, Omega, Jehovah, the King of kings, Wonderful way maker, worthy of my offering. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. All right, you may be seated. Thank you, Abel. I uh, want to remind you that uh, October 28th, our uh, worship leader, uh, Josh Stanberry, uh, will be joining us. And so, Abel, Earl, your days are numbered. Uh, so, uh, but aren't we thankful for what they've done for us? Amen. That's right. So, I remind you, uh, next Sunday, come prepared to share a love offering. Uh, Abel didn't hear that, and Earl didn't hear that, and the others who've been working and uh, with the ministry didn't hear that. It's our secret, but uh, we want to we want to bless them and and encourage them uh, for what they've done these months. I don't know that any of us uh, expected in January of 2001 that it would be almost November before we. Uh, uh, got a worship pastor on board but I believe God honored the wait and uh, I believe that we're right in the will of God uh, adding Josh Stanberry to our our staff team you know one of the things that I've really enjoyed uh, since September 9th when I began the sermon series dealing with the relocation was to hear from some of our church members and uh, as they have shared uh, testimony about their own life and how God is using them in our church family. And I, I thought about a person tonight, really a family, uh, that I wanted to share. Where is, is Krista here? There you are, Krista. Okay. I was looking back in your section, and you, you, you fooled me. Uh, <laughs> she wasn't in her place, was she, Mom? Uh, and so uh, I... Uh, I thought about the Tillmans. You know, they, they have four generations of, of people in our church. And when I came here, uh, I remember a call that I received when I, before I moved, and Brother Bobby Tillman called me on the phone. And uh, he said to me, I'm excited about you coming. I just want you to know that if I can ever do anything to help you and be a blessing and an encouragement to you, I want to do that. And I thought that was really neat. And then I came here and I got to know that there was more than just Bobby Tillman. There's Betty and, and Brother Whitey Tillman. And, and there's a lot of Tillmans around here. And the Tillmans have even increased uh, since I've been here. And uh, Krista shared something with me uh, a few weeks ago. And it spoke to my heart in such a way uh, that I wanted her just to come and and share, and I know she's kind of nervous, but uh, let's welcome her tonight and thank the Lord for her. Okay, how are y'all? Um, I just wanted to say that I have been a member here since I was like a year old, so that's quite a long time. Um, 
Let me see. Um, I have had wonderful Christian parents that I'm very thankful for, and wonderful grandparents. My grandmother has gone on to heaven, but we're all good members here for quite a long time, and that's always been an encouragement to me. Um, I became a Christian here when I was seven years old. Um, I used to go to Sunday school over here, when, and I had a um, Sunday school teacher named Miss Johnny Smedley. He's always told us that Jesus loved us, and so one day I was sitting right over here by this red, this black, this brown pole, and I realized that I was that I was a sinner. And so, I'm so nervous. Um, I, they asked for the invitation, and I raised my hand, and my parents were like, looking at me, and they're like, are you sure? And I said, yes. So I came forward, and I um, asked Jesus into my heart. Um, this is my church home, and I feel like this is where God wants me to be and where he wants me to serve. So I started teaching junior church in 1993, and we started off from a class of kindergarten through fifth grade, and we had about maybe 20 kids on the average, and that was pretty high for us. We were really excited about that. However, I was so excited to see how much we've grown in the last four years. We've now had to break up, and now I teach kinder, I mean, third through fourth grade boys and girls, and I stress boys because we have quite a number of boys in our class as opposed to girls. Um, we have like 25 just third and fourth graders learning. and we're growing, and we're running out of room in our class. And I was really excited, and I was hoping that you know, when we have a new building, we can have a bigger classroom, they can bring their friends, and we can have maybe 40 or something like that. And I just had the desire in my heart that I want to be one of those Miss Johnny Smedleys who reached me and who reached a lot of other boys and girls in that class. Um, I know it's going to be really hard to leave our church building, but we have to remember this is just a building. The church, the church is the body of Christ, and it's all of y'all and, and, and as well as me. Um, Hold on. Okay. I'm so nervous. I could talk to kids. It's hard to talk to y'all. Okay. I've lost my place. Okay. And I told him I would keep it really short and I will. Okay. I just, I had this thought in my mind that when we get to our new building and we have our big class and we have even more kids, you know how exciting is that going to be when we get to go to heaven? We'll see Mr. Haas up there and he'll give us all a hug. But you know, the, the ones that we reach for Jesus, you know, we probably fill up a couple of mansions or so, and we'll have overflow room out on, on the streets of gold, and that'll be really exciting to see how many of us will have reached one more, and they've reached one more. So, anyways, that was that. Thank you very much. Well, Krista was, was sweet, and... It was really hard for her to, uh, to think about the possibility that God may be leading us to a new location, but uh, I appreciate her spirit to follow the Lord's leadership in, in our church. Let's uh, pray before we receive our offering tonight. Father, I thank you for this church family. Lord, I thank you for the sweet spirit that uh, just permeates through our fellowship. And Father, we pray that Satan would not have a part of anything that goes on in this place. We ask God that your Holy Spirit would have control of each and every life that's here, each and every heart. And Father, I pray, especially tonight, as we, as a church family, talk about issues ahead of us and decisions that need to be made, we pray that the Spirit of Christ would prevail. Father, we ask that you would lead us and guide us. May we seek your will, and may we only desire what you desire. Lord God, I thank you for the rich history. I, I thank you for the bold past that you've given this church family. But Lord, I pray for our bright future. I pray, Father, that we would move forward in days ahead and do what you're calling us to do. Father, I remember the charge from David to his son Solomon. Be strong and do it. And so, Lord, that's what we want to do. In bold, courageous fashion, we want to march forward with you as our leader, and we want to be obedient and see magnified blessings come our way because you're a great God. We love you, and we thank you for tonight, and we pray these things in the strong and mighty and magnificent name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
you need to stand and sing that song great is the lord almighty he is lord he is god indeed great is the lord almighty he is lord he is god indeed great is the lord almighty he is god supreme great is the lord almighty he is lord he is god indeed great is the lord great is the lord sing it again great is the lord almighty he is lord he is god indeed Amen. I'd invite our, our deacons to join me here on the platform as uh, we prepare for our question and answer time. They, they would come now and our staff uh, would come. Also, I want to introduce, uh, as they're coming, two special guests uh, that we have with us tonight. Uh, I want to introduce to you Ron Lewis. Uh, Ron is a uh, consultant. Uh, his business is called Church Growth Designs. And Ron and I have had a relationship over many months, and he has been meeting with me and counseling me. Ron, would you come up at this time? Would you welcome Ron Lewis tonight? <laughs> also, uh, would like to introduce to you uh, Danny Musica. Danny is uh, owner of Service Realty. And uh, he has been advising our church and working with us uh, about the possibility of relocation. I'm going to ask Danny, if he would, to come and join us on the platform. Let's welcome him tonight also. Tonight's service is uh, just a little different than we uh, normally uh, would do, but uh, I do feel like... Uh, that we should turn our attention to the Word of God. And so if you would take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. And I'd like to read for you verses 7 and 8. Romans chapter 14, beginning in verse 7. The Bible says, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. I remind us tonight that the decision that is ahead of us is really not our decision. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are His. We have been bought by a price, and the Bible says, therefore, we are to to honor the Lord. We are to serve the Lord. We are to give everything that we have to the Lord. And so tonight, as we enter into this family question and answer time, 
I want you, first of all, to, to be comfortable. I, I want you to understand that we're having this time simply to make sure that everyone is, is on the same page, that we all understand uh, what God is leading us to do, why that we have reached this decision about relocation and believing that, that God's uh, purpose for us is to seek out a new location. And so we would really desire tonight that you would uh, find yourself comfortable enough to, if you have a question, to ask that question. And I remind you what uh, uh, Jeff Tokar said to me. He said, Pastor, if one person asks a question, usually about 75 other people are thinking the same question. And so I recognize that you may feel a little intimidated. You may feel a little hesitant about uh, voicing a question. And someone asked me, Pastor, are you nervous? I'm not nervous. I'm with my family. And so, you know, you don't get nervous talking to your family. And uh, so we're just discussing things and we're talking about what has led us through many, many months of prayer, many, many months of seeking God. Uh, myself, these men who joined me on the platform, these two consultants that I have walked with, and also this deacon body behind me, together we have, uh, we have sought the Lord. And then for these last five or six weeks now, I have done my best through a sermon series to try to lay out for you what we believe is God's will. But understanding that I preach uh, a long time, and usually even in those lengthy sermons, I can't say everything that I want to say. I know some of you think I say too much, but I, I usually don't even say all that I want to say. And uh, so we want to give you time to make sure that, that you have all of the uh, questions uh, that you might have in your mind answered. And so this is the way we would like to approach this tonight. If you notice around the room, there are four microphones. And I understand some of you are hesitant about speaking into a microphone, but I would ask you, if you have a question, to go to the microphone so that those who are in the room will have the benefit of hearing your question. And that way, when the response is given from the platform, it will have some sort of sense and uh, some sort of continuity to the, the flow of the meeting tonight. And uh, as you go to the microphone, these uh, you can just squeeze uh, below the mic and you can raise or lower. It's, it's just operated on a clutch mechanism. Just raise and lower it. And, you know, if, if you're tall like Br Brother Bob Turner, you want to put it up high and able, you just bring it down real low. <laughs> And, uh, and so, I'm sorry, Abel, as you're the first one I could think of. So, uh, but we, you know, we, we would ask you, um, just go to the microphone, uh, state your question as, as, uh, as uh, concisely as you can, and then we will try to answer uh, that question. So I would invite you, uh, whoever would like to be first, if you... Uh, and I know the first, there we go, okay. I'm not afraid. Okay, my questions, I have more than one, is that okay? Well, you want me to answer them all at once or just? No, I'll, I'll do it one at a time because they're kind of simple and y'all might think it's silly, but it'll break the ice, okay? okay. I want to know, are you going to give us hot water in the women's restroom to wash our hands? <laughs> I, I'd like to defer that question to our associate pastor, David Gilmer. It's simple, a hot water heater, it's simple. Okay, another question is, um, when we move, I mean, as you're making these plans, I was wondering if y'all could get with, say, like Brother Tommy to make sure our, our new kitchen, fa kitchen facilities are more up to date, because I know he wants one of those walk-in coolers, you know? And, uh, okay. and we need better stoves and stuff like that, like cooking with gas. <laughs> Cooking with gas. So I just thought, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of knowledge within the church body, and um, like Brother Tommy, maybe he could give you some suggestions as you're making the plans in these stages, so that those things are included. And then um, I also wanted to know because uh, I love drama. <laughs> I want to know: Are y'all planning on making it uh, a place where we can have wonderful musicals that are drama-friendly, lights, music, and all that, you know, for the drama, so we don't have to move everything around and all that? I mean, you know have great lights and stuff. All right. Yes, are you? <laughs> I mean, I want to know. I mean, is that in your plans? I was just wondering. Yeah, let, let, let me address uh, these issues, and uh, you have some more? One more. All right. One more. Okay, I'm ready for them. Uh, is the name of our church going to change? 
And do you have an idea on what it's going to be, or, or is okay. it still in the stages? And that's it. Okay. Thank you, Anita. You know, aren't we thankful that people are... <laughs> She brought up good questions, and, and let me, let me uh, try to answer them. Because I, I think, you know, the issue of, of hot water, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's a reminder to us, dear people, that, that we right now, we are in a facility that is aging. Uh, we are in a facility that has served a great purpose. We are in a facility that was, was built with a lot of hard work, energy, and money, and, and investment. But as with anything else, through time, it, it needs attention and it needs, uh, needs to be brought up to date. One of the things we recognize as our church continues to grow the, the uh, restroom facilities really are inadequate for uh, our size of church, and uh, we just have some limitations there. Uh, our kitchen, uh, aren't we thankful that we can come up here on Wednesday night and, and have a meal together? But all of these lead to the fact that as we go into a new building program, I want to remind you that we will go in with a master plan. We will go in with professional architects and professional uh, people who understand modern churches, who understand the needs of the 21st century, and they will help us design a building that will enable us to continue to grow for years and years and years to come. One thing we need to consider and always remember, we're not looking on the short term, we're looking at the long term. We're looking at a long-range plan to where our small children can grow up in Jupiter Road Church, or, and I'll speak to the name uh, in a minute. They can grow up in the church, have children, marry, raise their children, and we can just go on for generation and generation and generation. And so the questions of the facilities are an important question, but that's a question that needs to be addressed. In other words, someone may say tonight, well, what's the new church going to look like? You know, wh what color is it going to be? You know, is it going to be round? Is it going to be square? You know, folks, I want to tell you, those are premature questions at this time. The issue before us is we need to, as a body, say it is God's will for us to go into a new location. And then, if you'll remember, in one of my messages, I said to you, we will put together the Bright Future Vision Team, and the Bright Future Vision Team will consist of pastoral leadership, deacon leadership, and lay leadership in our church, those who have input and those who have expertise in many, many, many areas, and we will all combine together and we will formulate the bright future vision for our church. And so uh, I think you need to understand the facilities right now will be a question that will be addressed in the future. Uh, let me just say something about the name. The name question really is something that needs to be addressed in the future. Uh, we need to think about, would it be best for us to keep this name and move to a different location? Would it be best to adopt some kind of new name? Would it, we don't know at this point. And so I'd, I've been asked that question several times. You know, what, what do we do about a name? And the truth of the matter is we just need through prayer and asking God, God, what will be the best thing for us in the future? Now, here's something that I, I agree with Ron. Uh, Ron, come stand beside me, would you? Because I want you to know this man. Uh, deacons, didn't you enjoy Ron being with us? Amen. Isn't, isn't he a blessing? Uh, this is something that Ron has helped me understand. And Ron, if you could just address how these two issues need to be separate issues, not, not tied together, especially tonight. Okay. Well, those are all great questions. I just want you to know if I stay working with this, all those things will be addressed. Uh, both from your perspective and, and a planning perspective. Also, when, when you start to relocate, there, there, there's some clarity. You need to know the will of God. That, is it the will of God to relocate? If we can get that all solved in our minds, it's the right thing to do, we're going to solve the rest of the problems. 
the one thing we don't want to do is start getting into issues about a name change which really has nothing to do with the will of God at this point but but there may need to be and I think if you can just be open uh, to say when we get out wherever that's going to be that uh, if that's appropriate great if it isn't then let's look at something else the, the thing that you, you you have to keep in mind today the great churches of the future are going to be regional churches your church is already it we couldn't get the map up here clarified enough for you to see it but your additions are already coming from outside the neighborhood and so you're no longer just a Jupiter Road and the, the immediate environment church those are the churches of the future where people come from all over a city there was a time when people limited where they drove and stayed in the local church and that that's not the way it works anymore and uh, people go where their needs are met where where they have the kinds of things they want for their family it's kind of a cocooning thing we go where where there are our people and and they meet our needs and it's our kind of preacher and our kind of music and that kind of thing and uh, and that's why when you get regional sometimes your name can compartmentalize you to a location when you really don't need that you need to be metro something or what I don't, I don't I don't even want to put out a name it's just to be something that says we're we're not just for that location we we're we're, we're in a metro situation northern type thing okay let me uh, before the next person comes to the microphone uh, let me just say to you you may be wondering who who is Ron Lewis Ron uh, travels all over the United States consulting with churches uh, not just about relocation but how many are you involved in right now about 10, about 10 around the nation churches that are relocating and but uh, he he deals with the the current culture he he understands churches and he understands what churches need to do to uh, reach people in the future one thing he has said to me that has struck in my mind he says he says you to be a church that's making an impact in the future you're going to have to be more than a thousand and so uh, we're going to have to reach out and continue to grow to be that full service kind of church and so uh, I hope Anita that did that uh, help you tonight okay are there others now look, we're just family amen just just step up and and uh, if you want to line up at the microphones that'd be fine with me so just grab it below and squeeze it, and you can raise it. Can you it. hear me? This I think we can hear you. Me. That's fine. Well, I'm not, my question may be at the other end of the spectrum from too small to too big. But, uh, like, I'm a school teacher, and my income level, I'm kind of wondering maybe the bottom line of the, what it's going to cost, maybe, or close, and how that will impact a lot of us who are going to be trying to finance it. Okay. Um, we, we anticipated uh, a financial question tonight. And one thing I would, I would say to you is uh, what Ron has helped myself, uh, what he has helped me and helped our deacon leadership understand really is, is a, a process and it, and it really is visual in such a way that, that tonight we are not prepared to show you how the finances are going to work. But next Sunday night, if, if I hope you'll come back. I hope more people will come next Sunday. But, Ron, we're going to be prepared next Sunday night to show you financial projections of our church and to show you how we can work this, how God can work in our church in order for us to build and to grow. Uh, he'll have to do that uh, in, a, in, a, in a fashion where it'll be up on the screen you'll be able to see it you'll be able to grasp it and understand it and I think you'll be able to leave here next Sunday night knowing you know what that's doable but I, I want to say this about the finances folks it's a matter of faith and it's a matter of trust in God if God has called us to do it if, if God really wants us to do this I just believe in our heart God is going to provide the way and uh, so you know from us being able to to sell this property and acquiring land to moving in to the the uh, building process and uh, if I didn't say it earlier I meant to uh, I want you to understand as we move into the building process as we acquire the land folks we will move in in a phase in other words we'll move in to phase one and phase one most likely 
will not be our finished worship center and, and in the, the place that, you know, is going to become home for us. Phase one will most likely be some type of multi-purpose building where we not only worship there, but on Wednesday nights we eat there and we fellowship there and we do certain things. You say, well, why don't we just build our worship center? Because when we go to our new location, and Ron can testify to this, isn't it true, Ron, that, that in most locations the attendance doubles within two years? Okay, did you hear that? He believes, and through studies, and, and I think this is true, that the attendance will increase 54% in two months. 40, 40 months, I'm sorry. I, I thought God was really going to do something big. Amen. <laughs> so, four, four or four zero? Four zero. Here, here's what it'll do. If you're, if you're thinking in terms, of, and your question is so well put, I said this first thing when the pastor came to talk to me. I said, the first thing I want to tell you is money's not going to be your biggest issue. Now, in the minds of most laypersons, it is the biggest issue. But I can tell you tonight, as a guy that's been through this thing so many times, I'm, into, I'm involved right now in about my 21st relocation. But also, I'm involved in a lot of growing churches, some several thousand, three and four, five thousand tenants. We always think that's where, it's going to, where the problem's going to be. But it ultimately comes down to that's not our biggest issue. Because as when we walk in the doors the first time, every church I've been involved in up to this point has, has increased 27.6% minimum the first Sunday and never looked back. So in the case of how many we have this morning, 500 and something? 535. 535. So you'd be thinking in terms of somewhere around... Um, uh, well, what, about 600 people the first day, and it would never, it would, in other words, today's Sunday would be an ice Sunday for you. It'd be ice and snow. You, you'd never look back. It, it, it goes on. I have a client right now. We just went into our building in Mother's Day, and I just preached a dedication service on, on September the 30th. And uh, we were, uh, when we voted to build this building, uh, we were running 380. 420 worship, 460 good Sundays. Big Easter Sunday was 600. We, had, we were averaging 840 people in just over four years. Well, just over three years. From the planning, you understand it takes about two years to plan this thing, get it like it's supposed to be, and then by the time we entered, and we're, we're already past that point. Um, the, the thing that we, we're experiencing is that in a, in a first 18-month cycle will be the most critical financial time. And then all of a sudden it just separates. I'll do this visually next week for you. But in other words, the money... And the, the, the cash flow and the outgo is just like this at the beginning. And then all of a sudden the attendance starts separating and the debt structure stays the same. And you just start growing out past it. And we'll all sit there one day and say, you should have built this thing bigger. But you only have so much money to start with. But, uh, but the, the key issue will not be financial. The key issue will be understanding that the kids are going to have to get the best of everything for us to do what has to be done. And, yeah. In other words... Starting with the bed babies, they get the best. Uh, children, second best. You, third best. And adults, we just have to make out the best we can. Because uh, for us to move into the new future, y'all, we're going to be where there are lots of young couples and a lot of babies, and we're going to be run over with that. We have 20, about 27 to 28% of all the people that attend this church are below the age of 11 right now. When, when you get to another location out where these young couples are in the new housing units, that that'll jump to about 34, 35 percent. So for every 100 people walk through the door, 35 of them be below, below the age of 11. That's why we got to think, and that's, that's where our minds uh, has to do that. And we could go through why it won't work here, but y'all, I think you know the building couldn't stand the pressure, that kind of growth, the building you have at this point. So, um, but, but the money thing will be tight at the beginning, but it will take off uh, in very unusual ways, and I'll show that next week. All right, someone else. Did that help? And please, understand, next week we want to do that. And Captain Tokar, are you going to help us with Elmo? Uh, okay, Brother Jeff, is gadget man, is going to bring a, a gadget here so Ron can, uh, can draw on it, and it'll be whatever he doodles. If you like his cartoons, it'll show up there. Amen? And so, uh, so cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I like that. All right, someone else, you have a, have a question. Uh, 
Is this on? Okay. Okay. Thank Are we gonna have? <laughs> I didn't even. Stop Lee, okay. just. Are we gonna have to move into a place, into a temporary place of worship for any amount of time? Okay. Um, Lee, don't go anywhere. We're we're gonna get to you. Okay. Um, Keith, and our our desire and our prayer is that God is gonna time this in such a fashion that we can be here and acquire our land and start our building and we do it in, in one move. Now that, that's, that's our prayer and that's our desire. Um, we don't know if we'll have to go into some type of temporary uh, worship place. Um, I can tell you the size of church we have now, it is hard to find enough space for the size church we are. You know, some smaller churches can, can go to like the storefront or the shopping, you know, center and, and get them a place. But I mean, you know, Pastor Art and all of our children and, and you know, just everything, the size church we are, it's going to be hard to find that kind of thing. Uh, we might be able to go to a school and, and you know, rent a school and, and do some some innovative things. That's not what we desire. We really want to do this in, in one, one step. Uh, Danny uh, Musica is helping us with that, and we're, we're talking uh, to our potential purchaser of this building and uh, their timeline and their time frame, and uh, we're praying that God is just going to work it out in such a way that, that we can get our land, we can start our building, and and make one move. I, I can't guarantee that. You understand that. The, the plan may have to be fluid and may have to change a little bit. Yes, Lee? I don't have a question, but I have a comment because I'm practically a fixture here since I've been here 30 <laughs> years last June. And my family, a lot, half of my family was raised here. And a lot of people have asked me what I think about it. And so that's why I'm here. I noticed, and I don't think this is any private interpretation, but I noticed that the ethnic makeup of our end of town has changed a lot, and we're open to all uh, ethnic variety of people, but um, it's changed a lot, and I feel like our growth potential is not what it used to be Amen. here. And so I, I felt like God uh, revealed this to me before you came out with it. <laughs> and uh, you know it's I know other people have looked around where we used to have uh, Methodist and Presbyterian and so forth down the street we have uh, Oriental and we have um, lots of them and, and then we have temples right in the area of different kinds and then we have what was going to is going to build next door and so I think all of this um, that gives us a mission feel in a way but it does limit how many we can reach for Jesus. Amen. And I think we need to be in a neighborhood. And a lot of people have asked me because they know that I've been here so long and I probably won't even live to see the finished work at my age. You're just not guaranteed of that at all. But uh, this is my church and I love it. And you're the, you people of the church. Amen. Not That's this right. building. Amen. Lee, that, that brings up a good point. Marta, if you'd shoot up slide A, I, I want to show you something that, that goes right along with, with what uh, Lee has shared with us. Um, I, I, I really should be wearing my lavalier tonight, and I'm not. Um, I apologize. Let me just grab that. If you can uh, see behind me, uh, I don't know if the screen uh, will show it all, but what we're showing you are the demographics in a one mile area. If you would, for instance, take our church as, as a center point and draw a one mile circle around our church, we want to show you what has taken place in the last 10 years within one mile of our church. Now, what you'll understand is these are the census uh, statistics from our own government, and so we've, we've obtained these. And what you're going to find out in a 10-year span 
from 1990 to the year 2000, uh, the white population within one mile of our church decreased 16.8%. Do you see it up there? Now, tonight I needed a red laser pointer, okay? Any of you guys have one in your pocket? David, you didn't bring yours tonight? Oh, well, okay. Uh, uh, it would have been helpful, but, but I think you can see. Guys, I've, I've got this on. You got it? Uh, the top right-hand figure where it says white population decreased 16.8%. If you notice, the Asian population increased 73.7%. The Hispanic increased 121.4%. That's just within one mile of this church. And you say, well, pastor, do you, are you saying you, you don't want to reach different, different people for Jesus? No, that's not what we're saying at all. What we need to understand, though, if, if God wants us to stay here, we must transition with the neighborhood. We must understand that if we're going to stay here, that means that we're going to have to do ministry different in the future. That means that we're going to have to become a multilingual. We're going to have to become a multicultural staff. I'm going to have to uh, be the, the senior pastor, and we're going to have to develop a staff around me that, that can reach Asian people, a staff that are, is around me that can reach Hispanic people, a, a staff that can reach all of these different cultures. Because, you see, I can't do it. And, and you know, the staff that we have up here right now, we, we can't do it. And so what we need to understand is if we're going to stay here, then, then we're going to have to do some things differently uh, in the future. What we believe is exactly what Ron said. The best future for us is to become a regional church. And that means that when you become a regional church, you position yourself in such a way that you have easy access from many different parts of the Metroplex. And that way, many people can get to you. Wherever your people may be, they have easy access and they can come to you at a convenient, significant location that is very visible. And so that is why we have desired to, to try to situate ourselves in the uh, growth area off of 190, the 190 corridor, okay? And so, Lee, I agree with you. And uh, I didn't realize you were such a prophetess. I'm going to con con consult you in the future. And... Uh, but I, I thank you for that comment, and I think you understand through the demographic studies that we've done that uh, we feel that that's one of the reasons that God is leading us into a new location. Okay? Marta, thank you. Are any questions about what you see behind me? Okay? All right, Marta. Any other questions? Okay, the, the question was, how far on 190 are we looking? Um, and I, I've said this before, uh, right now we, we do not have a, a specific uh, tract of land that we have zeroed in on. Um, I can tell you in my own heart and in my own mind, I, I think if you can envision uh, uh, 190 and basically Renner, uh, back down to 190 and Lebon, somewhere in that stretch of the 190 corridor, uh, would enable us to to I think reach a lot of people in the future, and try to give us visibility uh, for the future. Uh, we don't know. Uh, I do know that the land out there is is very expensive. Um, I know that it's, it costs a lot of money, but I, I do know that, that if we're going to do something significant for the Lord, then, you know, you want to get in a good place, amen? And, you know, if you want to get in a good place, you, you've got to pay for it. Uh, you know, the old adage is true, you, you get what you pay for. And if you want a good spot of land, then, then you've got to pay for it. Uh, 
And so we're praying. Um, what have I asked you to pray for? Big gift now. And so pray for a big gift. Pray that God somehow or another, he, either he had work in the land or, you know, he had work in someone's heart. And, and you know, I, I don't know, uh, you know, who, who or what. And they may not even be connected with our church. Um, you've got a story about that one, don't you, Brother Ron? And uh, a man walked up to you. How much did he give? Two million dollars, not even a member of his church. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of God we serve. And so uh, what we need to do is we need to not put limitations on our Heavenly Father. We need to understand that He's a great God, He's a big God, and He has all power and all might, and uh, He can provide for us. And so, uh, Cindy, did that answer the question? Kind of in what area? Uh, okay. I, I have to be careful about those signs. You know, sometimes I do stuff that... So, then. I'm not real good at sign language, so Cindy tells me, quit trying to do anything, Brother Jerry. Just quit it. Someone else have a question? I have a three-part question with two sub-points to each part. <laughs> David Whittington, could you come get him and remove him, please? No, actually, Miss Lee kind of stole my thunder. Other than the makeup of what is the radius of our church, is there any other reasons why we wouldn't want to just bulldoze everything we see and just build something here? Any other reasons? Um, well, that's something we, we really wrestled with. And um, a as you know, uh, when our church really started to grow, when, when God just really did uh brother david was it 98 or 90 is 98 that we just had that huge year um and you know god we remember i asked you to pray for three things i said pray about us going to uh two services uh the left turn lane and then i asked you to begin praying about putting a family life center here on this property and so we kind of started some wheels in motion we started doing some things to find out you know where can we put it uh you know where would it sit how much would it cost and and you know we came to find out that you know to do a nice family life center one that you know has adequate facilities educational space and and those kind of things we're you're looking at 1.5 million you know or, or more and uh, uh, one thing i did not understand until i began my my walk with with ron was that on our present site we have limitations. Although we have an empty field uh, out here to, to our, our, your right and my left, we only sit on roughly 8.8 .8 acres of land. And so what Ron helped me to understand is, what can you do on 8.8 .8 acres of land? Uh, Marta, let's put up, I think it's slide D. Uh, let me show you something that, that helped me understand why we can't just build the kind of facilities we need to build here. In church today, what you find is you need one car for every two people that come to your church. In other words, if we had 500 people here this morning, then on an average, you're going to have 250 cars come to your church. Now, it takes one acre of land to park 100 cars. So if we want to grow to a church that has 1,500 people, that means on an average we'll park 750 cars. 750 cars means 7.5 acres of just parking lot. We only have 8.8 .8 acres here. Do you, do you get what, what I've come to understand? Uh, it clicked for me. Those of us who, who, when we have big, big Sundays, we, we understand the, how the cars line up to get out of here and how it takes a long time just to get out of the parking lot. And Ron helped me understand access and egress. In other words, 
you need more than one or two places to get on your parking lot and you need more than one or two places to get off of your parking lot. In other words, people aren't going to stand, wait in line 15 cars back to get out of your parking lot. They're going to go to a church where when it's over, they can get to Kentucky Fried Chicken before the rest of the people. And so, uh, you know, they want to get out of there. And so we have at this present location not only a limitation on our acreage, but we have a serious access and egress problem. And the only way that the access and egress problem could be addressed would be to go out here and try to work with the cities to get new curb cuts and left turn lanes and, and lights and other things. And folks, you remember, it took an act of Congress just to get this one over a year's work, us going with Garland and Richardson and Garland and Richardson and all the money it took. Uh, I don't think that's what God wants us to do. So, um, but I, I, I have come to understand that, that on this present location, we'll probably never grow more than 700, 750 or so, uh, the way that things are situated now. So, did that help, Earl? Thank you. All right, someone else. By the way, as Joyce comes, y'all are so great. Thank you for coming to the microphone. I'm, I'm, I hope that doesn't bother you. Has there been any discussion or um, anything presented that maybe our church could, should consider using our facilities as a Christian school. Will this come from our, um, uh, the, the personnel that you've um, asked to come and help our church, will they give us, a, um, what am I trying to say, a picture in our society if our church needs to offer that our church as a facility for a Christian school? Because I know a lot of large churches, you know, have the schools also. Okay, Joyce, let me make sure I understand your question. You're, are you speaking to the future? If, if we were to relocate, go to a bigger facility, would we then consider the possibility of a Christian school? Yes. Okay. Because if, if, if that is something that's needed in our society and, and, you know, these men that have come to advise us, then we as a church need to be aware as Christians, that is something that's necessary, and maybe on the front end, make our building um, available for that type of okay. Christian service. Okay. Uh, Ron was asking for clarification. You do mean in a new location, not in this right. present location. Right, in the new location. Okay. Is that something that our church is even going to consider? Let me, uh, let me address that um, at least the way I feel right now. Um, I believe in Christian schools. My, my children, up until this present year, went to private Christian schools. Uh, I believe they have a role in our society, and I'm thankful for Christian schools. I think one thing you have to do as a church and as leadership and as staff uh, in the church, I think personally the leadership, the staff, and the body really have to have a call from God to do a Christian school. And at this point, in, in my own heart, in my own mind, that is not what God wants, at least me, to, to undertake. Um, now, I want to say this to you. I, I'm in the year, two years, two and a half years, if we're in a new location, and if God impresses upon us that, that we need to uh, enter into the Christian school business, then we will approach it in the same fashion we have approached the relocation through much prayer, study, and consideration, and we'll do what God leads us to do. If I guess that was really my question. Yeah. Had that even been mentioned or yeah. considered, or had the Lord even revealed that, yeah. you know, to you? Yeah, uh, I think uh, whether or not in the master plan, we will go in with the master plan in mind that this is going to be set up as a Christian school, at least in my own heart and mind, that's not top priority. God, God has not impressed that mm -hmm. upon me at this point. 
that's not to say I'm not open to God's leadership if, if that's what we need to do. Uh, as I said, I think Christian schools are wonderful. Uh, my kids had been in one for, for years, but, uh, and I think they have a place in our society. And we will, you know, if, if it's such that we move out to a location and if we think, you know, that a Christian school is what we need, and, and let me just say this, though, I want to be, be clear, and God leads us to do a Christian school. I don't want to do a Christian school just because they're a great thing. You understand, in our society, there are a lot of great things out there to do, but folks, we got to do what God called us to do. And we can only do as much as God called us to do. We may not be the body uh, to be able to handle a Christian school. Um, of course, I don't even have kids school age. I just, you know, yeah. I guess sitting back there, I hadn't even, that's, you know, yeah. it's the first time I'd really thought about it, but I was just kind of yeah. wondering, you know, if that had even been, you know, like I said, the, maybe the Lord had revealed well, that to, or even to somebody else. Because yeah. like you say, we do have time. And if the Lord reveals that, then that's yeah. something we can. One thing I, I never want to do, Joyce, and I hope all the church family understands this, I don't want to say we're not going to do anything. I mean, I, I want to be open to what God wants us to do. And, you know, if God calls us to get in the Christian school business, Brother David has been a Christian school principal before, and he'll make a fine wow. Christian school principal. <laughs> Amen. Thanks. <laughs> now, privately, Brother David would be glad to tell you why we don't need to get into the Christian school business. But uh, that's, that's another issue. Oh, he wants to do it now. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. I'm thankful. You know, isn't it good that our church family can laugh and talk together? Amen? I want to tell you something, Ron. I don't know if you know this or not, but I believe this on my heart. There are not a lot of church families that could do this kind of deal tonight. You guys realize that, don't you? We're thankful that we're a loving body. Amen? Amen. I really am. I'm thankful for that. So, someone else. Until they get me a digital clock back there, I have no idea what time it is. So, <laughs> y'all don't have a question. I do. Uh, do you anticipate when we do move to going back to one service? Okay. And also, one more thing: is the bout time land um, a possibility? Okay, I understood the first question. What's the second question? The bout time land is that a possibility for us to purchase that land? Oh, okay. All you know right. what I'm talking about? Yeah, and we'll become Bout Time Baptist Church. <laughs> That's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> now, uh, let me tell you what Anita is referring to. How many of you, since we've been talking 190, tell the truth, you've kind of driven out there and you kind of looked at some places? Be honest. I know some of you have. Okay. If you notice out there on 190, there is a large portion of land that is, it has a white pipe fence. Um, that land is owned by a relative of Dr. Sumner Wimp. Um, actually, uh, she is relative of uh, Mrs. Wimp. Uh, she likes Mrs. Wimp. She doesn't like Dr. Wimp. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth, and Dr. Wimp will tell you that. Uh, she, she's not a believer. Uh, she really could care less about church. And so really God would have to work in her heart and life uh, for us to get some of that land. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at all of our possibilities on, on 190, uh, around 190 area. And so if you notice the white pipe fence, uh, and matter of fact, she owns land that doesn't have a fence around it that you may not even realize is her land. And so, uh, you know, we're just open to God. Say, God, you know, you bring us where you want us to be. I've been praying for her. Uh, so, amen, amen. But that, that could be part of the big gift. Um, now, let me address the, the one service issue. Uh, will we ever go back to one service? In, in my heart and, heart and mind, folks, the days of one service churches are, are gone. Uh, if you want to be a church that reaches people for Jesus, you have to offer choices. You're going to have to give people, you know, a choice to come early because they've got something to do late. 
Are you going to have to give them, you know, a later service, you know, if they can't get there early? And folks, you know, I, I used to be dead set against Saturday night church because I grew up in a tradition that had Saturday night church and I saw it as just a way of getting out of doing what you ought to do on Sunday. Now, God has been speaking to my heart and he's telling me, you know, there are a lot of people, Jerry, that, that have to do some things on Sunday and they're miss, missing worshiping me when, you know what, they might could come on Saturday evening. And so, folks, I, I'm just open to whatever the Lord wants us to do. But I want to tell you this. I do honestly believe the day of the single service, you know, everybody being able to get into one building, it, it's, it's not around anymore. Now, how do we address that issue? We address it through our Bible study fellowships. We address it through our small group ministry. And part of our philosophy is we must grow larger and smaller at the same time. And so as we expand, uh, we may go into this building. It, Lord provides us a new building. We may have to do three services on Sunday morning. We may have to do two Bible study. We may have to do what they call twins. Isn't that right, Brother Ron? And where you're flip-flopping, where you have not only a service going on, but you have Bible study going on, then everything just flip-flops, and, and those who are in the service go to Bible study, those who went to Bible study go to service, and you know, there's, who knows what we have to do in the future. But I do believe in my heart the days of the one-service church, they're, they're gone. Now, they're still around, but they've got about 50 people in them, and... Uh, you know, they're just hanging on. So, yes, ma'am. Can I make a, may I make a comment? Sure. Uh, I think that we are looking at a great potential for reaching so many different ages of, of people. I've been in uh, a church that was small, and so uh, I worked with the children's ministry, and we had a great teacher pastor. And to try to get people to leave the church service to come minister to our own children was a real challenge until we went to two services. And then people could go to one service and then the other service minister to our children or to our teenagers or whatever. Amen. And uh, we felt so strong that we must minister to our own in the body and right. not pay staff to watch children and stuff like that. So I think we have to rethink that we go to Sunday school and church. Right. We might want to go on a, a Saturday night and keep children and right. then come on Sunday to that. So I think we're just going to have to enlarge our ideal of ministry Amen. to include more than just the Sunday school and church. That's a great comment. Thank you so much. Amen. That's right. God bless you. A lot of churches are going traditional and contemporary. Have you thought about that? Yes. Uh, let me let me address that. And uh, you know, the worship issue uh, is one that has been prayerfully uh, considered, and one that, of course, we we have seriously considered uh, in bringing on our our new staff person. And uh, Josh and I basically uh, agree. And I think the rest of our pastoral staff agree. Some of our pastoral staff have been in churches that have offered uh, the traditional service and then the what, what is termed contemporary service. And uh, to be honest with you, they will testify that, that it basically produces a schizophrenic type church, a, a church that, that really doesn't know what it's about. What I believe in my own heart is we need to be a church that understands biblical worship. We need to be a church that understands worship in spirit and in truth. And so just like this morning, we, we embraced a worship time that included two hymns of the faith and then also included some of the newer music. And, and I think pur purposely, that's what we need to continue to do is we need to continue to reach out to that, that generation that, that does not understand church and provide them a way of not only hearing the new music, but hearing the hymns of the faith done in a way that is quality and uh, done in a way that honors the Lord. 
Now, let me just speak to this, this issue. I'm, I'm glad the worship issue came up because I'm passionate about it. I'm very passionate about worship. And uh, I just want to say to you that, that, folks, what we need to understand is we need to get past the style issue and we need to see what the Bible says. The Bible says we worship with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. The Bible says over nine times in the scripture, sing to me a new song. God is the God of today. God is the God of now. And I love singing about what God has done in the past. I love singing uh, testimony songs and telling people about what God has done. But I want to tell you something. God is alive today. And God is present today. And what we need to do is we need to show to people that God is alive, he's, he's here, and he inhabits the praise of his people. And so uh, to answer your question, Mary, uh, my personal philosophy is I don't want to get into the schizophrenic type church. I don't want to be one thing one way and then another thing another way. I want it to where if we go into multiples, that, that if you come on Saturday night, you're going to see me, you're going to hear me, you're going to hear our worship just as it is. And if you come Sunday morning at 9, you're going to see the same thing. And if you come Sunday morning at 10, you're going to see the same thing. If you come Sunday morning at 11, you're going to see the same thing. Because what happens is we start to grow in one area. And then some other areas aren't growing. And when the church starts to grow in one area and the other area isn't growing, it creates jealousy. And you see, the church says, well, why are they getting that time slot? We're bigger than them. We have more people than them. You know, we, we, we reach more people. Why are they having that time slot? And why are they doing that that way? And see, folks, we just need to be a family that, that loves and, and understands biblical worship. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. I believe with all my heart that, that Josh Stanberry is God's man to lead us in the future. He's 25 years of age. I'll give you five reasons right now that he shouldn't be here. He's better looking than I am. He sings better than I do. do. He, he plays golf better than, than I do. He's skinnier than I am. He's taller than I am. I could give you all kinds of reasons that he shouldn't be here. He's younger than me, but I want to tell you something. He's God's man to be here. I believe with all my heart he understands biblical worship. We're going to do the hymns. We'll always do the hymns. We're going to do them with class. We're going to do them with flair. We're going to do them in a way that, that honors the Lord, but we're always going to do hymns. But I do want to say to you, we're going to also embrace the new music because the Scripture says, sing to me a new song. And so we want, we want to do that. Now, Ron has helped me with the worship also. And, and you know, Ron, Ron understands that, that if we're going to reach people today, you, you've got to reach them in a way that, that they understand. And, you know, folks, part of coming to church is just what we heard this morning. It's not about just being comfortable. It's about trying to do something to reach G more people for Jesus. Now, folks, I want you to understand my heart. We are not going to do music that does anything to dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm not going to do that. You know, we're not going to put on a rock and roll show. We're not going to do things that, that bring uh, reproach upon the name of Christ. But I want to tell you something. I want you to get this in your mind. The Bible says God inhabits the praise of his people. So when we come to worship, our focus ought to be on him. We ought to sing to him. We ought to worship to him. We ought to lift him up. And if that means we're doing it with how great thou art and amazing grace and victory in Jesus, that's fine. But we need to be singing to him. And our focus ought to be on him. And so, you know, I, I have some... I have some uh, they borderline on, on conviction and they borderline, uh, you know, uh, on my own heart and feeling about worship. But I, I do believe that churches that are doing the, the, the two types of, of service end up 
sending mixed signals and mixed messages. Uh, Ron, have I explained that adequately? Do you have anything you want to add to that? I probably need to say something because we haven't talked this over. This, this, this will prove to you we haven't talked this over. The larger you get, the more schizophrenic you'll be. And uh, when, when you get into... <laughs> you see, we're all in some way manic, depressive, schizophrenic, and uh, paranoid, and it all pays off eventually. If you'll be all those things at least once, you, it all pays off. You're, better, you're a better servant if you're paranoid anyway. But um, the thing that I need to tell you is the pastor has a passion about this. Now, I have clients that we have four different kinds of worship. I have one that has a country western service on Sunday, Saturday nights, but the music motif is the same. It's just that it's in the country, it's in the country flair. It's in the country beat and country weather and, and, and country dress. Now, I have others that it's a, a more hot or rock type thing where, uh, where, it's, uh, where we have a praise team. We have four people, and they're dressed in black, and, and uh, we have, we have a, quite, a, quite a different kind of band structure than, than we normally do. And, and, uh, and, then, and that does drama. You know, we have all kinds of things. We have other churches. That, that are more what we call a crossover. They'll blend it as the pastors talk about the hymns and praise music and that sort of thing. There really are some definitions that are coming clear now in church life. And uh, I have a church that took me four and a half years to convince them to have a praise service and to have it at 1130 on Sunday morning. And uh, everybody said nobody will stay. Well, it's, it's gone from 400 to 900. And uh, we, we jumped 900 in one year, and we've jumped from 1,900 to 2,800 in that, in that year, and we already need a second praise service like that. But the service embodies many different kinds of music, not just one kind. But when you get to Amazing Grace and sing it, it may not sound like Amazing Grace as you sang it 30 years ago, but the words will still be there in some of the phrasing. But it's always a challenge, y'all, and you have to come to your own personality of worship. You have to figure out what it is God wants you to do. Your pastor has a passion about music and worship, and you're getting a great music guy to come in here who has a rich background in a lot of different kinds of music. And that's what you have to have. You have to have somebody that can come in here and say, it doesn't all have to be this way. And one of the things the pastor and I have talked about is don't confuse your preference with your theology. Because... If you read Psalm 150, it says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him in his mighty expanse. And praise him for his excellent greatness. And then it starts like saying, Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and the word we don't use in church, dancing, D-A-N-C-I, but just forget <laughs> I said that, okay? And praise him. With the, with the stringed instrument and the pipe and praise him with the loud symbol and then praise him with the resounding symbol and let everything that has life and breath praise you, the Lord. Now, picture, if you will, in the Old Testament, they had a half a million people sometimes in these great mountainside meetings and some people couldn't sing and they just cracked rocks together and took sticks and beat them together. Anything that would raise a praise offering to the Lord. But I do think that as, as your pastor leads you and guides you, you're going to come to a theology of worship that fits your church. And once you do, you're going to find a whole host of people out there who respond to that. But you can develop a church that has multiple types of services and not divide it any worse than we already are because, you know, Baptists have never agreed on everything. At least I've never seen them do it. But, but we can get our minds together that when we walk in this building... That, that as a pastor leads us, the number one thing is to meet God, however that happens. And if, we, if, if your pastor and your, your commitment to worship is this way, then I say commit to it, sell out to it, train your musicians to it, set your service up for it. And I will say this much, y'all, to do great worship today, you can't do it in one hour. It takes at least 70 to 75 minutes to do a great worship service today because there are times one of the key things you need is plenty of music and you need time to pray. All great churches have meaningful prayer times in their services today. And they're praying. If you read the Dallas Morning News today, you're seeing there are more and more churches that are praying for healing and deliverance and that kind of thing. And you can't do that in a hurry. And so as you, as you look into your future, as you ask about the, the components of the building, probably, and y'all, you understand we're a thousand miles from, from de design, 
but keep in mind that the next building you built will be more suitable for presentation of drama, music. It'll be more of a theatrical type building than it will be stained glass windows and that type of thing. It'll be built with light bars and, and high technology because the guy you're getting to come here is a really a trained musician and he's going to want a lot of different types of ways to express worship. So I, I hope you, you listen to your pastor. He's got a real passion about this worship thing. But I did want to be fair with you. There are churches that have multiple types of presentations uh, and, and are growing quite well with it. But you have to get a certain size to do that. And uh, um, you can't have a church of 150 or 350 or 400 people and have three different kinds of worship. But as you get larger, you may find yourself in need of that type of thing. The only reason I talk to you about being larger, y'all, is because the church that runs less than 1,000 is having a hard time impacting the world today. And, and, and people are looking to a church to be a full-service church. They want it for senior adults all the way down to the bed babies. You have to have a certain size to be able to program and minister in that arena. It's just like the music that the pastor's talking about. You have to get to a certain size so that you can minister with the talent that it takes to touch all these different different people. And uh, it takes over 1,000 people to do that. And I, the, you're not going to have any problem with 1,000 people. The question is, how can we get out there as quickly as possible and get on God's fast track? And uh, so I, I, I just want to affirm the pastor's concept of worship. Y'all hammer it out. It's the number one divisive issue in Baptist churches today is worship. So don't y'all get caught in the trap. God will lead you to the kind of worship that suits you and meet your needs and, and just rejoice in it. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. I used to like him. <laughs> Someone else. I can't help but think that maybe in the minds of some people, even though we've already addressed the financial issue once tonight. It's in your mind. Maybe it's the state of the economy. Maybe it's something you're going through personally. I just ask you to reflect on the right perspective of the God that we serve. It's the God that created the world in six days. It's the God who led millions of people through the desert and provided for their every need. We're not wandering through the desert, but can I remind you that the children of the desert never had to worry about the soles of their shoes wearing out or their clothes. And if God makes the soles on these shoes last a year or two years, and it gives me another $70 to give towards God's purpose and God's plan, then praise be to God for knowing that I needed the shoes to last longer. If it's the suits that he's afforded me the opportunity to wear and they last a bit longer, it is that same great God who watched over me and took care of me in that way. And it may sound trite and it may sound trivial to think about a disposable razor lasting longer than it's supposed to, or a can of shaving cream. But it's the thousands of little things that add up to the unassailable difference. If I have to cut coupons, I'll cut coupons. If I have to buy discount groceries, I'll buy discount groceries. Money is a big thing on our minds because we're human beings and we don't know how we're going to make it from day to day without money, without an income. But we serve a great God. And he's going to work out all of the details, all of the money, everything that we need to buy, don't need to buy. He's going to provide the direction because he's given us competent counsel. He's given us leadership who desires to excel and to raise to the next level to reach one more for Jesus. And so as whereas I know that the financial issue has already been addressed once, maybe that didn't settle it in your minds, but if anything I've shared with you this evening, it reminded you of this evening, 
plays back in your mind again and again as God, as the Spirit brings it. I'll only praise God because He's the one that wrote it in the Scriptures, preserved it throughout the years and the generations for us to read, to gain wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and insight from. Amen. Thank you, Joan. Anyone else? That two services of traditional and contemporary is not something that I was uh, wanting us to do. I wanted to clarify that, but I was wondering uh, if that was just a way that the Lord was leading you, and you certainly answered that, and I appreciate it. I, uh, Mary, I want to I want to state something to you. Um, I want to be teachable, okay? Uh, if if God impresses upon my heart that 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 is a way that we can reach more people for Jesus, uh, and that's something we need to do, then then I, I want to do it. I, I want to do whatever we can to reach more people for Jesus. That's not going to compromise the Word and not going to bring shame or reproach upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm just telling you what we as pastoral staff and as we have talked to Josh and as we have searched out a worship leader, these are things that are in our heart and mind at this time. Now, you know, if I sit down with Ron some more and, and you know, he, he leads me and counsels me, then, then we may, you know, I, I don't want you to think, well, you know, that preacher said it and, you know, it'll never happen, you know, well, I hope you understand my heart. That's not the way I am. Uh, I, I want to be teachable. Uh, I want to be open to what God wants us to do. And uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just feel that that's where I am right now. Uh, you know, and I, and I recognize that, you know, some people look at our worship and they scratch their head and, and they say, you know, I, I don't understand that. But... Uh, in my own heart and mind, I, I just think that when you approach God and when you're open and when you really seek Him, uh, I think that's the most important thing we can do is when we come together, folks, it's not just coming together to sing about God and to sing stuff that, that you know, we, we have a pet preference for. It is coming together to get into the presence of a holy God. And uh, that ought to be our main goal and our main desire and our main focus is that we have come into the presence of a holy God to worship him and to praise him and to adore him. And I remind you, those people who are pitching a fit and upset about some of the music in the church today, if you go back 100 years, 150 years, there were people who were pitching a fit and griping about stuff like Amazing Grace and standing on the promises and all that stuff. And so let us be careful that we are not characterized as a people who merely gripe and complain about the music because the music that you love and that you grew up singing was a problem to some people in the past. And just keep that in mind. And so have an open heart and open mind and embrace what God is bringing. You know, if it doesn't violate Scripture, if it doesn't dishonor the Lord, then sing to the Lord with all your might. Amen? Praise Him. Praise the Lord. So, someone else? Y'all ready to go home? <laughs> yeah. All right. I, let me say this. If you didn't have a question answered tonight, uh, we want to offer you the opportunity to do that again next Sunday. You say, well, Pastor, why are you doing this again next Sunday night? During this week, there may be a question that comes up in your mind. Uh, there may be something that the Lord brings to you. We may gather next Sunday night, and Ron may address the financial issue. And after he addresses that financial issue, you may sit there, and we may not have another question. But I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do the same thing we do tonight before we go home, and that is we're going to get on our face before God and we're going to pray. I don't think we ought to do anything until it's bathed in prayer. 
And we've got to seek the Lord. And that's what we have been doing for months and months and months and months. And so we would be amiss tonight if we did not get before the Lord and just pray and ask God just to work in our hearts and in our lives. Uh, Danny, I want to thank you for coming. We, we really didn't get into, into stuff that I thought maybe uh, he would be here to address but uh, he's available to us, and if you have a question that needs to be addressed to him, you contact me, and, and we'll get you in touch uh, with Danny. Uh, before we go to prayer time tonight, I want to read something for you. Many of you have heard me quote a great missionary by the name of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor once said this. He said, God's work done God's way will never lack God's resources. I found another quote from Taylor that I really liked, and I wanted to share it tonight before we pray. Hudson Taylor said this, Let us see to it that we keep God before our eyes, that we walk in His ways, and seek to please and glorify Him in everything great and small. That's what we want to do at our church. We want to keep God before our eyes, we want to seek Him with all of our heart. We want to walk in His ways. And whatever we do, great or small, we want to be sure that God gets the glory. I want you to know, if you're here tonight, and if you have never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, God's giving you an opportunity tonight to be in His family. God's giving you an opportunity to receive His love and His grace and His mercy. There's good news for us. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and He paid all of our sins in full. And the Bible says if we'll call upon His name, we will be saved. Have you ever called upon the name of Jesus? Have you ever said yes to His wonderful gift of grace? Oh, I want to tell you something. God loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. And God wants you to be here tonight so you could hear the good news that Jesus loves you, He died for you, and He wants to be your Savior. He wants to be the Lord of your life. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're here tonight and you've never received Christ, our pastors are going to be down at the front, and I'd invite you to come and talk to them. Speak to them and say, you know what? I need Jesus in my heart and life because you do. If you're here tonight and you have a prayer need, you know what Ron said, churches today need to be churches of prayer. If you want someone to pray with you, these men at the front will pray with you. We'll talk to God together. And then most of all tonight, we want to be sure as a church body that we just get on our knees before the Lord and say, Lord, it's not my plan. This is your plan. God, it's not my desire. It's your desire. God, it's not what about what I want, but it's about what you want. What does God want for us in the future? And you see, folks, when we gather on October 28th and when we as a church family give our voice of affirmation, to what God wants us to do in the future. We'll be able to leave here that day knowing for sure that we've done the will of God. We've walked away in obedience. We've walked away united. We've walked away together desiring to serve the Lord. And so tonight I want to invite you to step out of that pew, come and flood this altar, and let's spend some time before we leave talking to the Lord and asking Him to bless our future. Would you come right now as the music begins? Would you just step out of those pews and come and kneel here all across the front? And we're just going to spend some time talking to the Lord tonight.
as you kneel and pray and talk to the Lord, I just feel impressed tonight. I, I just want us for a season, just for a season of prayer for some of our deacons to come to this microphone and, and just lead us in some prayer, united as a church family. And then in a few moments, after those who desire to come to pray, I'll close us in a word of prayer. So I'd invite some of our deacons now to come and lead us in prayer. Our Father, we come to you in prayer in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you and we worship you and we praise you for your Son who died on the cross for our sins. Lord, I thank you for the so many ways you've blessed us and you've worked in our church. I thank you for our pastor and our staff. I thank you for the counsel you've given to us in these men. Lord, I thank you for bringing Josh our way, a worship leader that can help us to come closer to you. And Lord, we pray now for guidance, wisdom, and direction. And I thank you for a pastor that has a burning desire and a heart to serve you. And Lord, I pray that our hearts and our motives would be pure. And Father, as you look across this earth to and fro, that you might look upon us, Father, and we'd have a perfect heart. Father, I pray that we'd be one of, of one accord, we would be of one mind, and we'd be of one spirit. Lord, we know with you all things are possible. And Lord, it's not to worry, but to follow. And Lord, I know, I believe, and trust that you'll give us all the things that we need, and you'll bless us. And Lord, I pray that you'll do that, that we can be a blessing to you, that we can reach the lost to Christ. And Lord, I pray that you'll provide the land we need. I pray that you'll provide the finances we need to build. I pray that you'll provide someone to buy this facility. And Lord, I pray that we can reach more for Jesus. Lord, we're trusting in you. We believe in you. We have faith in you, Lord. I pray that you'd let us see miracles done. Let us see your power come upon those who might be able to give. And I pray that you would give us that big gift. Father, we seek you. We worship you. We want to honor you. We want to glorify you. Lord, I just love you and praise you so much. Thank you for Jesus. Lord, open doors, guide us and direct us, for we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. stand before you, Lord, and I want to thank you for this body of Christ, the love that we have here, Father, and that we show one another, Father, in being one accord with your direction and guidance in our life, Father. Thank you for a pastor, Father, that stands firm, worships and prays you, Father, and that's trying to teach us, Father, and guide us and direct us, that we all would have the same vision. My prayer is, Father, that uh, done mighty things in the past and you're doing mighty things today father i ask that you continue to do mighty things in the future that there'd be one more for jesus father help us all to understand and know lord that uh, we can be still in prayer and we can hear your guidance and direction father through your word that we would continue to be one accord this day of time and trouble, Father, America is hurting so bad. We need to continue to lift you on high, Father, that your will would be done. Thank you again for the love that's here, the strength that you've shown us, Father, and the direction that you give us in Jesus' name. Thank you that he's a pastor that does seek your face and your guidance, Lord. And we pray that you'd guide us in all that we do, because, uh, Lord, without your guidance, we know we'd fail. So we just pray that you do guide us in everything, Lord. And uh, we, Lord, we uh, thank you for what you've already done for us and uh, what you are going to do for us. And 
We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Father, we're just so thankful for Jesus Christ and and the sacrifice that was made there. We're so undeserving. We just thank you for all the blessings that you sent us sent our way. Most recently, our new music minister. It, uh, we thought it might happen earlier, but it happened in your time. You sent Josh to us. You sent Brother Jerry to us. It. Uh, took a couple of years but wasn't in our time it was your in, in, in your time it was I think it was Providence that both brother Jerry and, and Josh were sent to us I think that it's Providence that it happened not chance that both these men are with us we need to trust brother Jerry's judgment and wisdom and vision that you put on his heart it uh, has been a couple year process for it's been on brother Jerry's mind and, and on all of our mind he shared it with the deacons he shared it with the congregation and he's doing so now I pray that the Holy Spirit would touch the hearts of the congregation that they put their thoughts and concerns and what might seem trivial to others but are important to those members of the congregation that these thoughts are on their mind, that these questions are on their mind. Pray that they'd go to the Holy Spirit in prayer and let the Holy Spirit deal with them and, and if something still lingers that needs to be addressed, come forward, talk to Brother Jerry, talk to the deacons, talk to somebody but look forward to a unified spirit and a unified approach to the relocation decision and the actual relocation if it's your will father we trust in uh, brother jerry that uh, brother jerry and the, the staff and the council that he seeks and the deacons uh, will be able to drop dot the i's and cross the t's and and none of this can really happen nicely without church congregation being in unison it's and I think that the Holy Spirit will be a big player in this and father we just thank you for all that you do for us we we know that you have a plan for Jupiter Road and that we all will be part and parcel of it and father we just thank you for all that you do for us and we pray in Jesus name and seek uh, seek your guidance and father we just love you and thank you for what you've done for us Jesus' name.
the stands. Sing with the Across the sanctuary, let's join hands before we leave tonight, and let's be reminded that the purpose, the reason we're here, is to reach one more for Jesus. God has set before us a wonderful opportunity. God is working in our church. God is working in our lives. God's timing is perfect. God's looking for a faithful people who will follow his faithful plan. Will we be that kind of people? Will we say, yes, Lord, we want to do what you're calling us to do. We want to reach one more for Jesus. Before we close our eyes, before this day is done, let's don't let another day go by without reaching one more for Jesus. Father in heaven, I ask you, God, Burn it in our hearts. Put it on our, our minds to keep your purpose and your focus in front of us. Lord God, I thank you for the sweet spirit in our church. Lord God, I thank you for the wonderful family time we've had tonight just to talk and to share our, our hearts and our concerns. And Lord God, I pray that as we go forth in days ahead, we would always have this openness where we can just speak to one another, where we can love one another and encourage one another. Lord God, let this be a testimony to the world outside. They don't understand the love. They don't understand the spirit. They don't understand the desire that we have to please you and to honor you and to glorify you in all things. Lord God, we want to put you above ourselves. We want to put your plan above our own personal agendas. And Lord God, we want to seek you. We want to serve you. Father, we want to surrender to you so that we might reach one more for Jesus. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's reach one more for Jesus. Let's sing that as we're dismissed. Sing it to the Lord tonight. Reach one more for Jesus.